Okay, let's get going. Um, I want to thank uh, all of you very much for making time to join us today. Uh, thank you all of you who are watching this video as a recording. And of course, thank you to our esteemed panel, uh, David in Tel Aviv of Clarity Capital, uh, Karen of Business France, also in Tel Aviv, Ivan and Stefan, who are both partners at Mazar. Uh, Ivan is in Tel Aviv as well. Stefan is located uh, at the Mazar Paris office. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Francois of uh, Pontu Avocat, whose offices are in Marseille uh, and Paris, and is joining us from Paris. So, hi, everybody. Um, our panel will share insights with you uh, over the next hour about the current financial situation globally uh, in Europe and in uh, France uh, in particular. We will be discussing the investment opportunities that have risen uh, as a result of the recent drastic changes that uh, uh, we are uh, seeing around us with a particular focus on France. We all know that in times like these, uh, certain opportunities uh, lose their uh, attractiveness, but others do surface. Uh, we have Karen, who is a senior investment advisor from the French Embassy uh, in Israel, uh, who will give us an overview of the investment environment in France. We also have uh, here the Mazar team and Francois, uh, who will both uh, give us a first-hand account of the investment opportunities that they're seeing in France. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself briefly. Uh, I'm uh, Joseph Adler. I'm a financial analyst and project manager at Clarity Capital based in Tel Aviv. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Clarity, Clarity is a global investment management firm with offices in Tel Aviv uh, and in New York. We are regulated by the US SEC, uh, the Israeli ISA, uh, and as well by the Quebec and Ontario um, regulatory uh, co commission. Well, we invest on behalf of our private and institutional clients across the diversified range of asset classes. Uh, we're involved in a large variety of areas of business, which include uh, wealth management, uh, family office services to high net worth individuals, uh, equity concentration solutions, uh, which David leads. Uh, we manage a variety of funds, including a private debt fund, and we specialize in socially responsible investing. We also provide fund distribution services to institutional clients. Uh, David Bootwell is our managing director. Uh, David, would you kindly introduce yourself and begin by telling us how COVID-19 has impacted investing in Israel, in the U.S., uh, and in Europe? Can you hear me, Joseph? Yes. Yeah. Very good. Okay. First of all, uh, uh, I, I love the fact that uh, we are using uh, this uh, new tool. It's the uh, first time we use this platform and it seems to be working okay. Um, I'm David uh, Bordeaux. I've been 30 years in capital market through different geographies. Um, lately, over the past 16 years in Tel Aviv, uh, working um, in different institutions from Bank Apolim to my own uh, fintech startup and almost two years now for Clarity Capital, where I'm a managing director, um, also in charge of portfolio management and um, other functions. Um, today, uh, I will start by answering the first question that you ask, uh, Joseph, which is quite a crucial question. Um, I hope you can see my screen. Have I shared it right? Very yeah. good, okay. Um, yeah, very good. Okay, uh, so the question being, uh, what is COVID-19 impact on investing in Israel, uh, the US and Europe? And I may surprise you, but I would say um, from at least two uh, different point of view, it's actually um, very little impact. Um, first of all, as investors, we care for and protect our client financial future. This hasn't changed. Our client chose us uh, because they trust us. They trust us because um, we simply um, cherish their peace of mind. Um, and this is why, by the way, we are so uh, heavily and broadly regulated uh, in Israel, uh, in the US, and in Canada as well. Um, they also choose us because we put their interest first, always. Um, uh, and this is also linked to the third reason why they, they choose us, is we also look for the best opportunities in the market. Um, and this is how we care for our clients. This hasn't changed with COVID-19. Also, something that hasn't changed is investing. We'll see in the third point that investment indeed have changed, but investing hasn't changed. The three tenets of portfolio management and asset wealth management 
haven't changed. Asset allocation is still the key driver to long-term performance and um, portfolio performance. Um, our portfolio are always aligned with our client long-term adjusted risk return objective. Um, our client's worth is diversified um, even more now uh, within the COVID-19 across asset, across risk factors, and across market, being public or private. Second tenet of investing, which is discipline, is still the name of the game. What you call plan your play and play your plan. Um, do not try, we do not try to time the market. We are always, as always, even more with COVID-19, on the look for asymmetric risk return opportunities, meaning we are looking for opportunities where expected gain ex exceeds potential loss. I'll give you an example um, of what we did during COVID-19. The junk bond market in the US, junk bond are um, bonds issued by a uh, corporate in difficulty, um, was offering a 7% risk uh, premium above the US government. 7% is a fat premium, according to a uh, historical standard. Um, this means that the market was expecting something like 45% bankruptcy of the first 100 borrowers in the US. Now, this is more than double the historical default rate in the US. Um, we said it is exaggerated, but we wanted to, to wait for the catalyst, as we say, you know, looking on the look for opportunity, but waiting for the right moment to go into the market. That catalyst came from the Fed, which itself put its balance sheet at work and bought junk bond in the market through ETF. We then decided to participate um, in this market uh, because we found that it was asymmetric return. And we also went in when the fact, um, when the, the, the risk premium was at 6.5% above government. Last but not least, risk management is critical to wealth preservation. I'll give you two examples. We have developed uh, over the years a specialty into hedging concentrated equity exposures for our client, as well as hedging currency risk in portfolio. So investment, sorry, investing as also investors hasn't changed. But yes, investment have changed with COVID-19. I think the core change is that COVID-19 has ex actually accelerated already existing trends. So it's not new trends, but it's already existing trends that are going even faster than before. And I will share with you two trends on the main asset class. Number one, shares. More than ever, it's a tale of two stories. So I would say over the last two years at least before COVID, high tech, um, uh, high tech or big tech share have outperformed what we call value techs, but this spread is now even bigger than before. This is the difference between high tech, which you see in the um, dark blue, and what I could call um, value tech, um, which is the light blue uh, line. You see that before COVID, there was already a spread, but today, the first five stocks of the S&P, S&P 500 is the index in the US that tracks the 500 biggest company uh, listed on their market. The five biggest share being, as you know, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, and Google are up 23% year to date, whereas the 495 other company are actually down 8%. This, is, this was an existing trend, but COVID has magnified that trend. On the second um, um, asset class with the interest rate, the race to 0% or actually negative rate has accelerated. Uh, it used to be uh, that we thought that Japan was not a model. Japan is now a model. We have here the flags of Germany, of Holland, of, sorry, Netherlands, uh, Switzerland, Sweden, and France. Those um, are five countries with negative rate. I also want to share a Bloomberg screen with you out of the uh, 2019 uh, developed market. You can see here that the 30 year rate is negative, incredibly negative for three of them, Switzerland, Germany, and the Netherlands. For 11 of them, um, it's actually below 1%. And for 18 of them, it's below 2%. So we are talking about a very, very low um, interest rate uh, uh, environment. Um, 
And so this race to zero and also this difficulty to find interesting, always interesting opportunity has effectively led us also as investors to look at private uh, opportunity. In this, uh, in, in, in this uh, framework, we have regular uh, uh, point of contact with Karen, who will come after me. And we had a conversation in the beginning, actually, of February, talking about potential investors, um, investing opportunity in Israel for France investors. Um, and during that conversation, um, Karen told me an incredible thing, which I will share to you after sharing with you uh, something which we are proud of. 2018, France was the French, was the champion of the world. It's a time for celebration. Um, I just would like, I just, I just enjoy that moment. So, uh, 10 seconds of silence to enjoy that moment. Uh, and not just bringing that slide uh, by accident. 2018, France was actually champion du monde in soccer. 2019 was actually France, who was the champion d'Europe, uh, the European champion in FDI, foreign direct investment, ahead of Germany and ahead of uh, the, the UK. Uh, which means that effectively the greatest share um, of investment in Europe was directed toward France in 2019. So this was actually a, a positive and amazing surprise to me. This is why we decided effectively to do this webinar. So I would say 2018 and 2019 were superb year for France. Karen, would you like to share, us, um, share with us why uh, even with COVID, 2020 will be an even greater moment uh, for France. Well, thank you, David. I hope you can all hear me. Okay. So thank you. you. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation. Actually, it brought me back to some uh, very nice memories. So thank you for that, David, indeed. Uh, okay, so hello everyone. Um, so I'm uh, Karen Gordon from uh, the French Embassy in Israel, more specifically Business France, which is the national agency in charge of promoting uh, French exports and foreign investments. And I am based in our Tel Aviv office. Um, can you see my presentation now? Yes, we yep. can see your presentation. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, indeed, uh, David. Um, 2019 has been an exceptional year for international investments in France. It's actually official. Uh, France is the leading host country for FDI in Europe. It's uh, the third year in a row uh, with record FDI showing an 11% increase, which puts now France in the leading position. And uh, this uh, highly positive momentum confirms the confidence that uh, investors and decision makers have placed in the country. So, here we go. So while 58 countries invested in France last year, the US remains the leading investor with 16% recorded projects, uh, followed by uh, Germany as a close second, and also the UK, which actually recorded the biggest jump among the top 10 uh, investing countries, up 142%. So indeed, we can say that 2019 saw the realization of Brexit-related decisions on the French Financial Center. So the main beneficiary of foreign investments is the French industrial base, which has been for 15 years. France is the European leader for hosting investments in production activities, with the number having increased by 19% in 2019. Another key factor is that France also became the first host country in Europe in R&D centers investments, outperforming Germany and the UK. France has a strong ability to attract major R&D projects, which have increased by 22%. So all in all, R&D activities represented 11% of all FDI in France in 2019. Just to give you a few examples, we've got uh, ARM, the leading British technology, British technology group specialized in semiconductor design, which expanded its R&D center in Sofia Antipolis um, with an extra 200 highly qualified employees. 
Another example that we have is also IBM, which created a French R&D center in uh, artificial intelligence in Paris-Saclay, um, focusing on cybersecurity and quantum computing. And the site will employ 350 people, including uh, about 100 engineers. Um, so what you probably do know about France um, is that it's obviously a, a large market. It provides access to 500 million customers in Europe, as well as an easy access to markets in the um, Middle East and Africa. Uh, that's why international brands are attracted by the thriving nature of the French market. Uh, for example, there's been just last year a 69% mm. increase in investments in wholesale and retail. We also have French corporate uh, players uh, who are truly global leaders, just to name a few, uh, Airbus, Total, Orange, Sanofi, LVMH, L'Oréal, and the list goes on. It's the first country in the world for cross-border trade efficiency, thanks to easy and free procedures. Uh, France has also one of the best talent pools, thanks to high-level schools and innovative training. And of course, Paris as a global metropolis is considered the most attractive European city. And since Brexit has become the first financial place in Europe with 180,000 employees in the financial sector and is a leader in terms of market capitalization, but also regarding asset management, derivatives and the insurance market. But what you probably don't know about France is that there are about 1 million engineers, which is much higher than Germany per capita. The average cost of a researcher is one of the most competitive in the world, 50% less than in the US uh, or Israel, 21% less than in Germany, and 17% less than in the UK. France is also fifth in the world in filing patents and it has a relatively fast and cheap procedure to set up a business, and its hourly labor costs are competitive, and not only in the manufacturing sector. So how did France become number one? Well, the French government has been implementing for the past few years a vast series of pro-business reforms to update the French social model and also build new skill sets as well as reduce corporate taxation. So the, the corporate tax has gradually been dropped uh, from 33% to a target of 25% in 2022. These measures aim to also simplify administrative procedures and encourage business development and innovation. So this reform agenda combined with Brexit, with the Brexit impact, we saw for, for instance, uh, numerous financial groups being relocated to France recently. Uh, the European Banking Authority, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley. But also combined with a long-term strategy of the country to lead in several areas, such as um, the industry of the future, artificial intelligence, aeronautics and space industries, uh, renewable energy, smart city, mobility, the car of tomorrow, software, uh, what did I forget? Health industries, the agri-food industry, finance and fintechs, and so on. So all of that, and of course, the high level of public uh, R&D funding, which is a major incentive to boost development of uh, the technologies of the future. So what happened during the COVID crisis? Well, a massive economic support plan has been uh, put into place quite rapidly and efficiently. An overall budget of 110 billion euros was allocated to support the economy, in addition to a three, an unprecedented 300 billion euro a scheme of guarantees to bolster bank financing for companies threatened by the crisis. And another 4 billion emergency plan for startups was also put together. Another mechanism which uh, got a lot of worldwide attention was the short time working where companies were able to preserve jobs by having the state take responsibility for all or part of the employees' salaries and use training mechanism to invest in employee skills during this time. Um, another thing is that um, among the series of call for proposals and tenders that uh, were, were published during the crisis, one was actually inviting foreign investors 
to set up uh, mask production units with uh, 30 per percent public support. This is one of the things that we actually discussed with uh, David a few months ago. So France really stood out and uh, will continue doing so. So what's happening right now and in the coming months? Well, a um, sector-based recovery plan has been launched and has started to be uh, implemented. For example, in the tourism industry, which uh, has been deeply affected, but also in the automotive with a revival plan of 8 billion euro, which will also be used to digitalize the industry and move on to clean vehicles. A tech and startups plan with a focus on deep tech, a plan in ecological transition to incentivize, uh, incentivize SMEs to reduce their environmental impact. Um, a 15 billion euro plan in aerospace, which will also be used to develop green aircraft. So in other words, this sector-based plan is integrated in an overall program of the government aiming to speed up the decarbonization and ecological transition of the industry. So finally, on my final slides, um, what are the investment uh, uh, trends that uh, we observe and we believe will grow? So one of them is uh, all the industrial and logistics activities for which you have now uh, a mapping of immediately available sites uh, with an express setting up procedure. We also uh, see an increasing demand for R&D centers. It turns out to be quite uh, simple and cost effective to base development teams anywhere in France. Um, another undiscovered opportunity uh, by Israeli companies is Euronext. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a marketplace that connects, um, that connects seven European economies and it's open to dual listing. Uh, so it's good for, for companies that wish to access European investors and it has a simplified process with Israel. We also identified several distressed opportunities in uh, areas uh, like the fashion and retail industries, the alumina production, luxury food brand, and the hotel and real estate. And uh, finally, um, international COVID-related uh, call for proposal uh, has been launched and will be open until the end of September for projects in uh, therapeutic solutions and other technologies, um, which will finance between four and 50 million euro per project. So there, there are multiple uh, investment opportunities currently in France in various segments and activities. And we will be very happy um, to help you identify the relevant ones for you. So if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. And uh, thank you for your attention. Back to you, Jay. Thank you, Karen. Uh, that was very interesting. And I think one thing that uh, ties what David was saying and what you're saying is that, you know, David was saying some of the changes uh, we're seeing are actually enhancing changes that were already underway. Uh, and you're talking about, uh, you know, changes that the French government is, ma is making as a response to what's going on. And obviously those changes, some of them will be permanent changes uh, and ones that are due and will be positive. So I think that's very interesting. Um, Francois, um, let's uh, move on to you. Uh, what are you going to speak about? Francois? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to talk about uh, new investment opportunities in uh, Europe, but uh, first of all I wanted to, to say a few words in, uh, uh, in Hebrew. Maybe you can see my uh, presentation right now. I wanted to say a few words in Hebrew, because I think it's an Israeli that understands Hebrew. I'm a Russian Czechian. I work in Czechian with 30 years of experience. I'm of course speaking Hebrew, and I hope you can hear me. I'm a Russian Czechian in Israel from 1992. ואני עבדתי בתל אביב בכמה משרדים גדולים ופחות גדולים, בוודאי אני, כבר, אני גם מוסמך בצרפת, 
אני מייצג כעיקרון בצרפת חברות ישראליות, אני עובד אך ורק עם חברות, בכללו עם אנשים פרטיים, בכל מיני תחומים, בעיקר ליווי חברות ישראליות בצרפת. אנחנו במשרד ארבעה אנשים, סניף ראשי בפריז ועוד סניף במרסאי. ועובדים בתחומים הבאים, ליטיגציה, חוזים, קניין רוחני, עוד כמה דברים קשורים לדיני חברות, ואני רוצה להגיד שאם אנחנו לא יודעים לעשות משהו, אנחנו בוודאי עובדים עם חברים למצוע. תודה, ז'וזף. על מה אני אדבר? Now I will turn into English. I will talk about a few things. Uh, first of all, um, about the Paris jurisdiction, a few words on uh, labor law, a few words on the creation of a French firm for uh, foreign residents, and uh, um, to finish on uh, distress opportunities. Uh, Paris jurisdiction. Why did I want to talk about this very uh, quickly? Because if you draft a contract in case of a dispute, uh, you can include a clause in your contract saying that uh, French law will apply and that the Paris court will have jurisdiction. Why? Because uh, since the 1st of March uh, 2018, which is quite uh, recent, you have a special chamber of the Paris court who can uh, receive documents in English and uh, hear the pleadings in English. So your, your lawyer from Israel can come to Paris and plead uh, your case in English. This is uh, free because uh, it's not like uh, when you go at the ICC, the International Chamber of uh, Commerce for Arbitration, when you pay uh, from the beginning 150,000 uh, euros or something like this. In France, you don't have to pay uh, for court. And uh, you get a very quick uh, judgment in less than uh, one year, generally. Uh, because the proceedings is uh, much more uh, simpler than it is in Israel. For instance, I don't want to develop too much on this and to give too many details, but for example, we don't have in France cross-examinations, uh, cross uh, which uh, saves uh, time. And uh, as I said, uh, you can plead in English. Second point, uh, labor law. I don't want to be uh, and to give too too many details because uh, we don't have much uh, time and I can't uh, make a lecture about uh, labor law on a, on a webinar. But just a few words. Uh, everybody thinks that um, France is uh, is a very uh, bad country for employer because you cannot fire an employee in France. I always hear this when I am in Israel. But of course you can, uh, you can, of course you have rules, but you can fire an employee in, uh, in France. And since the Macron uh, regulations, uh, the indemnities are capped. Uh, in practice, uh, we have to distinguish according uh, to the number of uh, employees in uh, each uh, firms. But uh, we can say that uh, when you are uh, up to two years of seniority, the indemnities will be capped at 3.5 months uh, of salary, which is not um, very, uh, very important. And uh, when you have, for instance, 30 years of uh, seniority, there is a cap of 20 months of salary, which is less than two, year, two years uh, salary for, for a person which is uh, employed in the firm for uh, 30 years or uh, more. Uh, you should note that there is no cap in case of harassment or discrimination. Therefore, labor law in France is not that bad. What about uh, creation of a firm? Uh, same uh, general remark as uh, I said uh, before. It is not that difficult to create a firm uh, in France. I have only, as I said, a few minutes uh, left to talk, and I don't want to develop, I can't develop too much, but you, must, you may know that you need a long stay uh, visa, which gives you uh, the right to uh, get a card de séjour when you are an Israeli citizen. 
then uh, you have the possibility uh, either of buying an existing uh, shell firm, uh, French firm which uh, exists, or to uh, create a French firm from uh, scratch. And uh, I have, for instance, Israeli clients who have bought uh, part of the shares of uh, existing French firm, the majority of the capital, and uh, doing business like this, it is really a possibility. Uh, I just wanted to say another word um, regarding the bank account. Um, it is not uh, complicated uh, when you know a bank. Of course, it's better when you when you know the bank or when your lawyer knows the bank. I'm working with uh, with a few banks which uh, are used to open bank accounts for uh, foreign firms or foreign citizens. And uh, you can, if you have all the documents, uh, open a bank account in a few days. And as a conclusion at this point, you see that uh, creating a firm in France is uh, not that uh, difficult, Joseph. Thank you for that, uh, Francois. Yes, uh, that's what it sounds like. Uh, and you may be the address for that. Um, could you uh, tell us what uh, kinds of uh, distress opportunities, like you mentioned, uh, you're seeing uh, particularly that are you know, uh, crossing your desk and, and what that environment looks like, especially now, considering the change in condition? Yes. Um, of course, um, uh, distress opportunities, uh, this concerns uh, many sectors. There is a lack of cash anywhere, everywhere, sorry, and uh, you can find uh, very good opportunities or very good offers in uh, various sectors like tourism, like uh, high tech, like uh, real uh, estate. Um, I would say a few words about commercial buildings because commercial buildings, it's not that uh, obvious now that it will. Uh, uh, pay off as much as in the past because uh, lots of people uh, are working from home and uh, we'll have to see what uh, will happen with the commercial buildings in the, um, in the next months. I give uh, just one or two examples. Uh, you have hotels in the French Riviera uh, for less than 1 million euros with uh, 12 rooms. Uh, you have a company software uh, who is uh, now uh, worth more than 5 million euros and uh, the price to, to buy this company um, can be discussed and negotiated very at a very low level. And a last word on uh, how do you uh, know the offers? Uh, we have in France access, access to uh, databases from uh, liquidators, Connes uh, Nechassim, and uh, it's very easy to identify uh, the firms who are uh, going to be uh, sold and uh, who are looking for business uh, partners. I will be very happy to answer uh, your questions uh, at the end of the webinar. And uh, of course, I uh, give you back the, the micro, uh, Joseph. Thank you, uh, Francois. Yeah, and you know, I think we've, we've all heard that uh, the uh, Hilton Hotel a company has uh, fired a tremendous amount of employees and obviously is uh, going through distress and you know these are places where um, you know there will be uh, opportunities uh, in the future uh, as well um, so I'd like to turn to um, Ivan uh, and uh, Francois uh, Mazar uh, has its roots as a French accounting and uh, consulting practice uh, could you please introduce uh, Mazar and uh, Stefan uh, before speaking about the investment environment and the opportunities that you're seeing in contrast to what, uh, uh, and in addition to what Francois has uh, told us. Hi everyone, I'm, I hope you can all hear me. Um, so my name is Ivan Shapira, I'm a partner in our Mazar's office here in Tel Aviv, uh, in Israel. Um, uh, I'll be uh, handing over to Stefan shortly, but before I do that, I thought I would say a few words about Mazars in, uh, in general. Uh, Mazars is probably a name that is well known to any French participants to this call, as it has its roots um, and its origins in France. But to any Israeli, <clears throat> to those Israeli participants or, or people on the call from, from the US and elsewhere, um, just to explain, Mazars is an accounting and consulting practice. It employs about over 40,000 people globally. It's represented in over 100 countries. Um, in France specifically, in our offices throughout France, we employ a few thousand people. Uh, probably Mazars has uh, relations with half of the CAC 40. 
in France. Um, in terms of Israel in Tel Aviv, um, you know, as an accounting practice, we provide the normal suite of accounting services, so that would include audit, advisory, tax, um, and outsourcing services. We have a number of clients, um, in, you know, that we uh, represent that have operations in Fl France. So, in terms of our practice, I would say over 90% of what we do in Israel is multinational, it's cross-border. We work with um, over 300 Israeli high-tech companies, infrastructure companies, kibbutz companies, and a number of them uh, have operations in France. Um, those include companies like Solar Edge, Alot, Cape, Checkpoint, you know, all who have set up operations in France. Um, I think one of the things that Karen mentioned, which is a commonality between Israel and France, is that um, both economies are heavily invested in technology and in R&D. So, um, as you know, Israel has many R&D centers of multinationals, um, corresponding to, I guess, a uh, focus of using France as a vehicle for those R&D centers um, in Europe. Um, in terms of um, you know, our practice, we, we function as an integrated practice, which means we won one partnership throughout the globe. Stefan, who, who I will hand over shortly, is a, is a partner in our office in Paris. He, he leads our global um, corporate finance practice, which is involved in DLN advisory. Um, and over the past 12 months, um, our practice here in Israel has been involved in a number of deals with French origins um, in terms of investment both here in France and vice versa, you know, uh, um, advisory deals going from Israel to France. Um, Stefan has over 20 years experience in corporate finance. He works with major French groups like Orange and Swissport. Um, and Stefan, maybe I'll hand over to you and you can, you know, give more of a focused um, explanation and discussion of the opportunities in France and on the investment uh, uh, environment in general. Yeah, thank you, Ivan. Um, are you able to see my presentation? Yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, I will say a few words about the m &A activity in France during the lockdown period uh, to give you some uh, some information about that. Um, well, for sure, uh, as in many countries, the, the, the MNA projects have been stopped or delayed. A lot have been stopped or delayed. Um, and this has been the case in sectors strongly impacted by the, by, by, by the situation, uh, impacted in terms of uh, activity or visibility for the future. So we've seen transactions stopped or delayed in, uh, in tourism, for example, and, and many uh, sectors that have been mentioned uh, in, in this webinar, for example, automotive, aviation, retail also. Um, but in some other case, uh, we've seen some projects uh, which were, was already launched before the lockdown period, which have been signed during uh, the lockdown period. And this was the case for some uh, uh, companies um, active in sector uh, with a limited impact, uh, or even in some case, uh, benefiting from the uh, the environment, uh, for example, in, in the medical sector, the digital, digital uh, in food also, uh, we've seen some transactions closed during the lockdown period on a remote basis. However, um, in this situation, uh, the, the buyers and the sellers uh, had to find a way to adapt uh, the deal uh, and uh, to, to find a solution to this very specific situation. So um, there have been different ways to, uh, to manage this. Uh, it could be in terms of uh, structure of the transaction. I will come back to this uh, later. Uh, and for sure, it also uh, has been in terms of prices, uh, prices and payment conditions. Uh, for sure, one simple way to uh, manage this situation has been to renegotiate the price uh, in some cases, uh, sellers were uh, okay to agree on a decrease of the of the price um, because uh, they were looking to uh, 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 to transfer the risk to uh, another player. And uh, we find some uh, situation where the, the the deal closed in 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 the in the lockdown period. Um, but uh, another option uh, has been to pay. Uh, 
a base price and to uh, negotiate an on-out agreement between the sellers and the buyer and then the future amount uh, will be paid depending on the result of the target. So this has been also a solution found by the, by, by the players and we've seen some of these of this kind in France. And um, other option has been to sign transaction uh, with new uh, condition precedent, additional condition precedent such as uh, recovery of the activity of the target. And we've seen some transactions signed uh, with a condition on the level of revenues, for example, uh, to uh, uh, recover, for example, to be 90% uh, of, the, of the sales on a monthly basis compared to the last year, and then the sale is, uh, is confirmed. So this was the situation during the lockdown period, and I suppose that uh, in other countries you, uh, you have experienced similar situation for sure. Yes, absolutely, uh, Stefan. Um, so um, we have uh, received a, uh, a number of uh, questions here, which uh, I think uh, would be interesting to hear your uh, response on in the time that we have left. Um, before that, I just want to say thank you very much, all of you, for your insights. Uh, I think a lot has been discussed, and it's clear that as things change at uh, the current rapid pace, uh, you know, with uh, the uh you know even the situation in israel uh getting uh, gradually worse and uh, and uncertain uh you know further updates uh, will continue to be uh, necessary and uh, and reassessment of uh, of the situation from an investment perspective which obviously uh requires uh us professionals to uh, respond and, and adapt quickly uh but like uh, david said uh stick to our uh, fundamentals um so um, of course, uh, if you would like to uh, address any additional questions, which we won't have time to address today, uh, you can all uh, send me uh, your questions directly and I'll uh, connect you with the panel members who can uh, speak to you uh, about those things. I will uh, start with the following question, which uh, I think would be suitable for uh, David. Um, we are uh, seeing a second wave of COVID-19 in countries that have reopened, not, not just in, in Israel, uh, in Europe as well. Uh, what do you think will be the impact of this on investing, on investment in the future? Um, okay. Nevoa, rat notnim le shotim, mo shomim beivrit. אז אני, זה באמת שאלה מאוד טובה, it's not easy to foresee the future. I was, I, I, my take is, I think that a government in front of what is happening today, in major developed industry, the unemployment rate is still quite high. It's the case in the US, it's the case in Germany, the case in France still, as well as the UK. My uh, feeling is that we cannot afford another wave of a complete lockdown. So I think that from a strategic point of view, government will probably choose to isolate some region, but I don't think we can uh, afford complete lockdown. However, the market is still very nervous. One measure of nervosity um, um, is the VIX, the famous VIX index, which still flies high at 32%. Uh, this is through, this is twice its historical level of 16%, um, and it doesn't seem to go um, in the direction of you know deflating. So there is a lot of uncertainty um, in the market. Um, I would say that um, even if there is no uh, second uh, second wave of COVID, in any case, some industry will have to readapt and review their business model. Um, because of structural change, and they've been mentioned by, by François, by Ivan, of course, uh, uh, by Stefan, and of course by Karen, you, you also um, mentioned them. Definitely um, um, hospitality, um, anything which has to do with uh, tourism, uh, leisure, uh, gaming industry, airlines. So those are industries which will have to review probably uh, their entire business model. Um, and some industry, the opposite, actually, COVID is pushing them forward. Um, and we've seen uh, the tremendous uh, and, and very powerful rally 
in high tech in high tech companies so i would say that even if covid 19 hits again um, some trends uh, are still in place they will keep going on and uh, as as i said in our presentation i think that a second wave of covid 19 will effectively accelerate even further and quicker what we're seeing today that's yeah not a not being a prophet okay thanks for that um maybe got another question here um for karen um uh if uh someone wants to get into the french market what type of services uh, does business france particularly provide uh for those people Okay, thank you for that question. Well, um, you know, since we um, are able to uh, some kind of uh, do like a soft lending in France, um, we can help in a, a variety of subjects. We can help with uh, um, getting into a market, getting market research, but also connecting to potential uh, industry players. Uh, we can help with regulation. We uh, can help with uh, um, the recruitment, the finding offices. Um, but mainly we, we connect uh, the, the foreign companies and the foreign investors with the various regions in France according to uh, the type of activity uh, they, they're in um, and we try and match uh, as much as possible uh, obviously so I just want also to uh, mention that our services are completely confidential and customers customized and also uh, free of charge. Thank you for that. Um, Stefan, uh, I believe uh, I skipped a subject with you. Uh, you wanted to uh, speak about a survey that you conducted about private equity during the COVID-19 crisis uh, with a focus on the French market. Yes, uh, I will share my screen again. Um, Please do. Yeah. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, We've performed um, a survey um, about private equity during the uh, COVID-19 crisis. Um, this uh, was a, a global survey for sure. Uh, we have uh, interviewed uh, private equity firms uh, in numerous countries. However, I thought that uh, it could be interesting to share with uh, uh, the participants to this webinar uh, our, uh, some of our findings and uh, to focus on some findings which are really uh, similar uh, at uh, what you, we have uh, um, seen in France. Uh, so these are, the, these are some of these findings. Um, first, um, what, what is uh, reassuring uh, is to see that um, uh, the, the investors are optimistic uh, uh, regarding uh, the, their business and uh, that they remain open for business. Uh, it was the case during the lockdown period. Uh, as you can see, 74% uh, of the, uh, of the, of the uh, um, private equity fund um, responding um, wanted to uh, remain open for business and were looking for opportunities, even if the situation was quite difficult. Um, what we can see also, uh, for sure, uh, that uh, uh, portfolio companies of private equity funds have been impacted by the situation, uh, by, by the uh, restriction in terms of uh, um, uh, confinement, uh, notably. And uh, uh, what you can see is that uh, um, more than two thirds of these private equity funds uh, have said that the impact in the revenues of their portfolio company uh, will be between zero and 25 percent. Um, the other finding is, uh, I mentioned the fact uh, before this web, uh, during this webinar is that uh, the D flow uh, slowed for sure uh, and uh, the private equity fund uh, have experienced the, uh, the, the slowdown in terms of D flow. Um, and um, in addition, regarding the exit strategy, what we have uh, 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 confirmed, in fact, uh, when interviewing this, uh, this equity, uh, private equity funds, is that because of this impact on their portfolio company, um, when possible, uh, they will pause 
uh, or delay their exit, exit strategy uh, from their portfolio company. And you can see uh, the, the, the results here. Um, uh, however, um, uh, one question was the distressed opportunities. Uh, Francois mentioned some. Uh, we also mentioned some, uh, some sectors where uh, we, which have been uh, strongly impacted by the, uh, by the, uh, the crisis. Um, but what we, uh, we, uh, we can say is that uh, the, the government measures uh, that have been taken by the French government and mentioned by Karen previously in this webinar uh, has helped companies to face uh, the, the difficult environment uh, during the crisis. So in fact, um, the private equity funds in France, and uh, it's the same uh, regarding m and players here, uh, have not seen so many uh, opportunities or distressed opportunities. Um, when we, we talk about oppo distressed opportunities in France, we must uh, um, um, mention that we have two kinds of situations. Um, we have the voluntary proceedings, uh, which are proceedings which will remain uh, confidential and where the company will uh, negotiate with the creditors in order to face the difficulties. Uh, so it's what we call mandat ad hoc or conciliation in France. And on the other end, and we've seen many, uh, 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 many uh, cases in the retail industry recently in France, uh, you have the judici uh, judicial proceedings, uh, which is public. Uh, and uh, we've seen uh, in, the, in this sector uh, many distressed opportunities. Um, but what I would say, as mentioned by Karen, uh, um, investors from foreign countries looking for distressed opportunities in France need to have a connection uh, with people on the ground because uh, for sure you have public, uh, public uh, opportunities, but uh, uh, to, to, uh, to have a proper investment strategy in France, you, you surely need to, uh, to be close to the business, to be, to be close to the sectors, and uh, uh, with the support of local, uh, of, uh, local people, um, Business France, for example, or Mazars, uh, we have 40 offices in France. Uh, um, we, we are, you are able to identify before the, the opportunities go public, um, uh, any opportunities uh, in, in that space. So at this stage, not, not many uh, distress opportunities, but for sure, uh, at the end of the year, uh, the companies will have to uh, uh, publish their accounts, 2020 accounts, uh, and we will, uh, they will have to discuss the covenants with the banks, and uh, we surely will have probably uh, more you know, uh, distress opportunities in the next few months. Thanks. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, that was uh, very uh, insightful, Stefan. Um, I've got one more question here, which I think we have time for. Uh, this is for Karen. Um, could you um, could you elaborate about uh, well, the question is, do Israeli companies come to you when they plan to open a subsidiary uh, or also when they wish to invest? Um, could you also uh, maybe expand a bit on that and touch on you know, what your uh, you know, formal uh, purpose is uh, located, located here in Israel and, and what business grants uh, provide uh, you know, whoever comes to them? Sure, sure. So our role uh, in this uh, specific mission of promoting foreign investment in France is mainly to identify, you know, uh, the companies who would like uh, to open up a subsidiary and so we help with all of that. Um, what's our interest uh, behind that obviously is the, the creation of uh, jobs. Uh, you know, it's good for the employment in France, it's also good for the French economy. So uh, it's very important for France to actually um, help as much as possible you know, foreign investors. Investors. So we do, uh, of course, help when it comes to opening a subsidiary, but also when it comes to like financial investments. You know, uh, if it is like a French startup uh, raising funds or M and A's, or also uh, companies that are um, currently facing some difficulties, um, we we also help with that. Um, the bottom line is that we really try and connect and make sure that you know there's no. Uh, uh, bugs in communications and that everything goes as smoothly as possible.
Jay, you're on mute. Sorry about that. So we have a few more questions, but we only have a couple minutes left. So I think best that we respond to those uh, by email. Uh, I would like to again thank all of you for joining us today as viewers. Uh, we hope you enjoyed hearing these insights from our panel. Uh, we very much look forward to other opportunities to share our views with you. Uh, and thank you, of course, to our panel members, David, Karen, Stefan, Ivan, and Francois. Uh, please be in touch with us uh, with any further questions. A recording of this webinar uh, will be available uh, shortly. Uh, wishing you all a very good day. Bye-bye.